Welcome to our viewers. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today, Maximizing Cost Savings in Uncertain Times. Presenting today are Randy Kern, Senior Strategist and Analyst at Evaluator Group, and John Tour, CMO at Cloudian. With that, I will hand it over to Randy. All right, thank you. One of the things that we're seeing in working with our clients is a real change in their strategy that deals with some short-term issues here. A lot of it has to do with the fact that many of them have had their projects frozen or they've been challenged to reduce expenses. Um, many are actually worried about their positions and saying that we've got to do something about cutting our expenses immediately and do it without really affecting our operations here. So we've done a number of projects now in talking to these different clients and helping them over a short term. And the short term is really looking out maybe a year and saying, here's some things that you can do to save money immediately, not introducing risk, not causing more expenses. And certainly you don't want to raise this as, hey, this is another project we're going to undertake. So it's become a really important thing and if not, one of the most important things for companies, certainly one that's in uh, on everybody's mind. So one of the things we've looked at is saying, here's the problem. Your business is continuing. You still have more data to store, more data to manage, you more data to protect. You've got to continue the things you're normally normally doing, and yet you've got to do it and figure out a way to save some money here. So the obvious thing, one of the simple things we talk about is let's figure out if we can change this capacity demand curve. If we can change the capacity demand curve, that will be some immediate savings and maybe some even longer term deferrals of purchases. So you can do this very simply. The simplest way is saying find some inactive data off your primary storage and just get it off of it. Gets it out of the data protection or backup cycle and really reduces those costs immediately if you can do it in a fashion that is straightforward and very simply. Uh, there's a lot of programs out there that you can analyze and say what data is inactive on your primary storage and on average it's typically about 70%. Very common say that this data doesn't really need to be here. doesn't mean you're going to delete it but you want to put it somewhere where I can get access to it as I need it, but yet free up what may be more expensive capacity and certainly that area that's in demand that I may have to buy new storage for. So you want to move it to a storage system that has lower cost that can scale to meet these capacity demands and very importantly doesn't add to the data protection cost. We call that a self-protecting storage system. Now, Cloudian is one of the examples, and you're going to hear from John a little bit more on the attributes of the Cloudian system as we move forward. But it's one of those that we end up in many of our engagements saying, this is a candidate that you need to look at as a way to reduce these immediate um, charges here, expenses. So there are some very near-term economic benefits. I talked about deferring some new capacity. One of the other ones that we end up with many times is um, customers may have uh, storage systems that are reaching the point at which they ha are no longer under their maintenance contracts. And so if there's a way that they can say, I don't need to renew that or I don't need to come up with a new contract for it, I can save a lot of money there. So consolidating those platforms as I reduce that can be, in many cases, an immediate savings. The other one is, and the one that typically is not thought of by many until it's pointed out, is the data protection costs are, are typically many times 3x the cost of the primary storage systems. If I can reduce those costs, I can really save some money here. I can defer the purchase of my target devices for data protection. I can maybe get some relief for those windows of data protection. And uh, most customers end up with uh, capacity-based licensing charges for their data protection. That ends up being an operational expense in many cases that they can reduce 
can have a very near-term uh, economic benefit. So let's turn this over to John to talk about a, a particular solution to save this money in the near term and do it without making it a, a big production, making it something that can be accomplished. John? Right. Yeah, exactly, Randy. So I think what we'd be good to talk about here would be some specific examples of exactly what you're saying. Uh, and just to set the stage, we, I'm using cloudy and object storage as the as the target in these examples. So it, it's S3 compatible storage, just to kind of you know level set on what we're talking about here. Um, well, we are appliances and software defined storage, and it's modular. But the important thing here is you know we've got some very specific examples on how this kind of storage system saves cost in several different usage scenarios versus public cloud versus a just a, a traditional NAS system by itself. We'll look at a Splunk example and, and then a tape example. So Randy, I think what would be interesting here, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of these examples and if you could kind of chime in on what you're hearing from your, you know, and your engagements from your clients on you know, what they're seeing in these different kinds of environments, uh, you know, we can get the, get the big picture view of what's going on here. But let's start with you know public cloud because this is obviously one a lot of people are interested in right now is you know the move to the public cloud uh, is very real and it has some very compelling benefits in in flexibility you can get storage capacity on demand but from a cost perspective I think people uh, sometimes don't factor in all of the costs associated with that move and I think it's important to remember that you're dealing with you know storage costs. But then in addition to that, you're dealing with access fees per gigabyte, access fees per, you know, each call for each access, transfer fees for going between clouds. And, yeah, I think this is something you and I talked about, Randy, was, you know, data management is still very much a, a factor in managing cloud storage, right? You can't just treat this as if it is a, uh, you know, a black box that is going to work all by itself and keep your data protected. You have to manage the buckets. You have to manage the configurations and make sure that everything is being properly configured to prevent breaches. Now, on the object storage side, you know, what we're doing is we're providing an on-prem equivalent to that. And obviously, there's costs cost associated with managing something on-prem. You've got the cost of the equipment. You've got the cost of the co-location or data center, wherever that uh, equipment is residing. And then you've got, you know, obviously you have to manage that as well. But if you look at the dollars and cents here, uh, you know, it, it, it comes out very interesting because, you know, if you think about how, what a public cloud is, it is a storage infrastructure that is being managed. So clearly, you know, somebody is setting up equipment, somebody is managing it, somebody is providing all of the associated costs and expenses and then charging you for it. And what that comes out to, you know, if you look at, at this example here of a petabyte of storage, you're looking at roughly twenty thousand dollars a month in the storage costs at you know, some at two point one cents per uh, gig per month. But you know, when you, when you add on the other expenses associated with that, you know, the, the access costs, the transaction costs, the bandwidth to get that data to and from that environment, uh, the cost over five years is on the order of several million dollars, and we came out with 2.2 million. And if you take that same environment with an on-prem solution, factoring in you know the hardware costs, uh, the, the software, the management, power cooling, uh, you come out with a cost of something on the order of seven, uh, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. So a 65 percent difference. But when you think about it, that kind of makes sense because. Again, that, that the public cloud provider is buying that equipment and managing it for you and making a profit on that. And, you know, clearly they have to plan for, you know, not, you know, a certain level of utilization of that environment. So if you look at, you know, the, the comparison here, I think, you know, there is a real opportunity to save costs versus going into the public cloud in, in use cases where, you know, you, you kind of know what you're going to be needing. You don't necessarily need all that flexibility. Uh, and you have the ability to plan out those expenses. So, Randy, maybe you could comment on what you're hearing from your clients in terms of you know public cloud versus on-prem solutions. Yeah, there's one really interesting aspect to this, which goes along with your management costs. Uh, we had uh, this may be anecdotal, but we had several different customers that had moved and started putting data in the public cloud, and we talked to them about it and said. 
you know, we modeled their cost and they weren't tracking and we went to figure out what was happening and they had more data in the public cloud than they anticipated. Digging into this deeper, what we found is they didn't plan on having to manage the data in the public cloud. They thought that would be a savings. And they ended up, in one case, five times the amount of data because they weren't managing it. So those costs had just grown way beyond what you show here because they viewed this as something they didn't need to pay attention to. They didn't have storage administrators addressing it. So the savings of the cost of the administrators were just phenomenal when they started paying attention to what data was in the public cloud. So we're absolutely seeing this, and we have with several clients gone through and done economic models about specifically moving data to the public cloud, both primary as applications move, in those cases, they would be going to, say, block storage with a certain performance characteristics, and then relatively inactive data that would go to S3 or infrequent access. And with different costs, you have to factor in, you know, obviously your egress, egress fees and all of that, but almost never is it cheaper. Exactly, and I, th I think you do make the exact right point there, which is you need to be thinking about your specific use case and fact, you know, do the math, figure out those costs in advance, and and get an estimate of what you think it's going to be, and then track it. Yeah, you know, we we certainly uh, we work with the public cloud providers. We provide interoperability with them to make it easy to move data back and forth, and our customers absolutely do that all the time. Our point is that you know be aware of what the dynamics are and pick the right environment for that particular data because you know if you if you can optimize both sides your public cloud versus usage versus your on-prem usage that's when you're going to get the best answer uh, you're not going to get the best answer just by picking you know over oh, we're moving to public cloud and that's where it's all going that is not going to be your optimal answer in, in the majority of cases usually you're going to get a better answer by looking at usage and figuring out where the best environment is for that data. And we're hearing that increasingly from our customers, like, yep, they're doing the math, uh, and they're finding out that uh, they can optimize by picking the right environment for each data. Uh, the second use case I want to highlight is, is, uh, is NAS. And you know, obviously, uh, network attached storage is a very important environment for you know, workflows, whether it be in uh, design automation or in media or in finance, you know, it's, it has numerous, you know, numerous applications. But what people often forget is, as you pointed out in your first slide, uh, the vast majority of that data that sits on network attached storage tends to be inactive, right? 60% of data is, been, has not been accessed in the last year. For that data, you know, there's very easy ways of migrating it to a secondary storage environment at far less cost, one third the cost, and still have, still maintaining you know re real time access to that data. You can you know users can still access it from the original NAS device even though it's been migrated off. And you have proven solutions from this for this from a variety of vendors. Uh, we work with Comprise, and you know what's interesting about this is that by by tiering this data, you get a couple of different advantages. One is that you you obviously re reduce your need for that primary storage device, which is more costly by a factor of three than the secondary device. Uh, the second thing is that um, you reduce your backup costs because now that data is in a self-protecting environment. So if you can move half of your data to a, a self-protecting solution, uh, you've cut your backup cost on that primary de device by half, because most backup is licensed by, by capacity. And you've done this without impacting your ability to access that primary data. It's, it's still accessible on that NAS device. So I think, you know, and the other thing about this is that because object storage is designed to scale, a, a single environment, a single object storage cluster can act as the tiering target for multiple NAS devices. I mean, object storage is designed to scale to an exabyte. So you can have multiple object storage devices tiering into a single uh, uh, object storage solution. 
We happen to be multi-tenant, which means you can actually set up different tenants uh, for those different uh, devices if you want to keep them completely separate, make sure that data never crosses, and make sure you've got extra levels of security in place. But you've got you know a, a, a solution that can scale, uh, so it keeps your management cost down. You're having to manage fewer devices and pay less on backup, in addition to you know, paying less on the on the storage device itself. So, Randy, maybe you can comment on what you know, what you're seeing in your clients uh, in this NAS scenario. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The um Moving data off of primary NAS is, is, is incredibly common. Um, what we've actually seen is a lot of them use a, a more of a two-tier type of arrangement where they'll move data uh, to a secondary device for a short period of time and then move it to another location where they don't expect to access it very often. And they do that for interesting reasons. They They want to reduce the number of times they acquire new storage systems. So they can get a very large repository system like the Cloudian and say, I'm going to have this in place and not have to continue to add capacity for a much longer period of time. Um, the the NAS part is great. That's a big one. The second one, we, the second biggest thing we see primarily is the uh, retain backup copy target. And most of the backup software can target S3 and we see this uh, consistently in almost all accounts. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, you highlighted S3, and this is all built on the S3 API. So when you're looking at solutions like this, just looking at this picture, I mean, the comprise scenario in there is one example of a data mover that does this. Uh, there are numerous others. So anything that is capable of moving data to the public cloud is undoubtedly capable of moving it on-prem to Cloudian as well. So you, you know, just bear that in mind when you're looking at the different ways of accomplishing this. Uh, they're all built on using the S3 API as that communication on the back end. And that's obviously done so people can move the data to, uh, to the public cloud. But you have the option in every one of those cases of storing it on-prem at less cost behind your firewall, et, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the different advantages that come with that. So let me just uh, move on to the third use case example here, and that is uh, Splunk. So, you know, Splunk, people are collecting vast amounts of data from, uh, you know, their different devices around their infrastructure using Splunk. And it's a great way of, of visualizing and seeing trends. Uh, and that data is typically stored in two places. It's stored on the Splunk indexers themselves. And then it's also stored on an attached NAS or SAN device. And Splunk has traditionally managed this in a way that keeps a, a pretty good chunk of the data in the Splunk indexers. They keep what's called the, the hot and the warm buckets in the indexers, and then they move the cold buckets off to uh, a NAS or SAN device. <clears throat> what's new in this scenario, what's, what's new is Splunk has a feature called Smart Store. And this was designed to use S3. <clears throat> and Smart Store kind of re redefined how that, because they got rid of a cold bucket. Now they have only hot, you know, they have hot buckets and warm buckets. And as those warm buckets age and become, you know, used, they can be tiered off to an S3 compatible storage solution. Of course, that could be public cloud or it could be cloudy in, in your data center. But what's interesting about this is that this tiering is something that happens automatically. It's still a warm bucket, it's, so it's completely transparent. It looks exactly the same to the Splunk indexer. And it's managed by Splunk itself, so there's no third party involved here. But a very high percentage of the data can be moved off to you know, this uh, object storage system uh, because, again, it's still a warm bucket. It's still going to be treated by Splunk as exactly the same thing as the data being held in the indexers. It just happens to reside somewhere else. Because it is the less frequently used data, it doesn't impact performance. So you're not moving anything that is being continuously reused. Splunk is simply monitoring usage for the things that are less frequently used. They go off to object storage. Now, interesting point here is object storage, of course, is 
disk-based storage. So you still have the same access characteristics of a disk-based system. You know, it's it's real time. It's no tape delay in terms of accessing that data. You don't have the latency of going off to a, a you know a remote location. It's in your it's in your data center. But that data is stored at a fraction of the cost of keeping it on an indexer or keeping it in the NAS SAN environment. It's about one third the cost of NAS SAN. It's also about one third the cost of keeping it in the Splunk indexer. And this math uh, that we are showing here on the screen. <laughs> Uh, it compares the two environments. So the traditional, where you're you know, keeping the cold buckets on a NAS SAN environment, versus the smart store environment, where that data is in warm buckets, but the less frequently used ones are moved off to uh, the Cloudian. What's interesting about this is because you eliminated that tier of cold buckets, and you, or excuse me, you eliminated the cold bucket, and you've done tiering on the warm buckets, it does two things for you. Uh, First of all, you've obviously eliminated the NAS SAN from the environment, which is going to you know, take out a, a big chunk of cost there. Second thing is that you're actually reducing the number of indexers you need because you're storing less data in that environment. Because of the, the warm buckets have tiering uh, and that less frequently used data can move off to the, uh, the Cloudian environment, you don't, have, you don't need as many indexers to store that warm data. So you reduce the number of indexers you need as well. And that doesn't impact your performance. Again, because you're keeping all that stuff that's most frequently used in the indexer still. That doesn't change. It's just the stuff, it's just the older stuff that's moving off. So you've done two things. You reduce the amount of NAS SAN you need, you reduce the number of indexers you need, you reduce the complexity of the environment, and you're still keeping all your data on prem. And the, the cost savings are phenomenal because this is 61% of the overall cost of the Splunk environment, including the Splunk licenses, the cost, you know, the cost of the indexers, and the cost of the storage. You're bringing that whole bucket, that whole infrastructure down by 61% in cost. So a pretty phenomenal savings. And again, the, the technology to do this is part of Splunk. It's not something that's a third party. It's actually a Splunk feature that you know is ready, is sitting there waiting for folks to use. Randy, do you hear people talking about Splunk storage and your engagements? Um, all the time, and it, it's become very popular. They've been incredibly successful with you know the advent of tracking everything with logs. One thing I want to point out here is the Smart Store is a great you know advancement, if you will. But if you were going to do that, say, to AWS S3 versus doing it on-prem, you're going to end up with some different requirements around communications. The networking requirements probably are going to be greater than what you might have had otherwise. So there's some savings there that really aren't shown here, but those are the things that you typically maybe not plan for but get an ugly surprise at some point at a later time. Yeah, we, we we hear about that in the context of the of the next uh, item we're going to talk about as well, which is backup. Uh, but yeah, the networking costs. If you're going to have to buy, you know, uh, WAN capabilities, I, I pointed out in that first that first example of talking, you know, comparing public cloud versus on-prem. But you know, WAN, you could be looking at thousands of dollars a month in extra, you know, I, you know, service charges to get the bandwidth you need to support a you know, a, a really robust Splunk environment. And I think that's something that you're absolutely right. That needs to get factored into the calculations, particularly when you're talking about backup. And you know, here, you know, this is kind of the, uh, it, it's kind of the killer app for object storage on-prem. It's, it's kind of the traditional use case for object storage in the data center. It's acting as a backup target. Uh, but here I'm going to compare a, a couple different scenarios. One is, you know, backing up from on-prem to the public cloud, uh, backing up from on-prem into a NAS solution, backing up to tape, and then backing up to, to object storage. And the reality is that, you know, the, the cloud is becoming a very popular scenario because, of course, you, know, you have that flexibility. And for small for small volumes, you know, it, it could be a good example, a, a good a good. Uh, uh, you know, use of the public cloud, but just bear in mind. You think back to that first slide of the cost you're incurring there, right? It's not only just the storage cost, but also the access costs. 
the cost of that bandwidth, particularly if you've got RTO, RPO objectives that are at all aggressive. You know, if you're going to be having to move that data to and from the cloud, that is going to factor into what you're able to achieve on RPO and, and RTO as well. So if you go back to that first slide I showed, just comparing on-prem cost versus cloud, it's easy to see how you can get cost savings by keeping that data on-prem. But bear in mind as well, you've got performance you know, to factor into that as well, because you're going to get much, much better performance doing it on-prem. You, you simply don't have to worry about that WAN, that WAN bandwidth. Uh, another popular backup target is going to NAS. Uh, and again, on-prem object versus NAS is about a 60 to 70 percent savings. One thing that surprises people is the comparison versus tape. Because you know, tape media is, is is obviously the cheapest way to store data. You you can buy a tape cartridge for for not much money. What people forget, though, is the cost of maintaining that environment. Uh, tape has to be re re you know continually managed. You have to be moving those tapes around physically if you want them to be out of the tape library for <clears throat> for worm capabilities. You know, for uh, for data retention. For excuse me, for uh, compliance. You know, to want to be removing those to a, a, a location that's outside of the library. Also, if, if for if for retention purposes, tape has to be rewritten. So, if you've got a retention policy in your environment, if you're a regulated environment such as healthcare, financial records, uh, and you've got retention requirements that uh, you know need to be adhered to, that tape's going to have to be rewritten at some point because tape goes through generations, and ultimately, that after a five five years or so, that tape is going to be obsolete. So you'll want to be rewriting that data. When you factor in the cost of the handling that debt, that information, plus you know rewriting that information, uh, any handling costs at all significantly increase the cost of managing that tape environment. With object storage, there are no, there are no management costs uh, in, terms of, excuse me, in terms of data physically handling. It's all, on, it's all disk. Uh, and the other thing I'll mention here is object storage can be configured as WORM. So if you're concerned about you know retention, if you're concerned about compliance, if you're concerned about uh, protecting your data from ransomware, object storage can be confer, uh, configured as a non-rewritable media. And what that means is that you have SEC compliance for uh, rec record retention for essentially as long as you need to set it for. Our customers that are using it as protection for ransomware may set it to 30 to 60 days uh, just so they make sure they've got a new, fresh copy of data written uh, before the old uh, ransomware um, lock ages out. For people that are concerned about healthcare records, they may set that retention period a lot longer. But you can set that retention period on the object storage, and, and for that period, you have non-rewritable media. And that's really important uh, when you're comparing backup targets. Yes, you can do that with tape. You can do that with object storage as well. So, Randy, can you comment uh, you know, and what you're hearing from your customers as far as you know the the alternatives for backup targets? Yeah, well, let me uh, stop on the ransomware thing for a second. Uh, typically, one of the things in uh, working with customers is um, you know the IT people are responsible for infrastructure and all the data and. Of course, data is central to that. Uh, you end up with uh, the security people being really in a separate area, and they tend to come to the IT people and, and talk about some types of protection from ransomware. And as soon as they talk about, hey, we can put this into an object storage system with immutability, and the fact that it can't be, you know, deleted, can't be altered for a period of time. The security people see that as uh, adequate for that, and they go off and worry about you know penetration from the networking and stuff. So, the IT people getting them to go away is probably the best thing for them. Uh, but the, the yeah, absolutely, the targets here make perfect sense. Uh, tape uh, anybody that's gone through tape forward migrations can absolutely understand this. If you haven't done that. Um, you may not appreciate it until you go through and realize that how difficult it is from administrative standpoint to do that migration to the next LTO technology, for example. 
as a backup target, what we typically see is most customers are actually moving towards using not using tape for um, for as backup targets. That's been underway for a period of time. You've seen tape more for uh, putting data on there for that has uh, some type of requirements that it has to be taken to an off-site location, and that meets that demand. I even had one customer that wrote it to tape shipped them off and said, I'll never see them again, which I thought was an interesting approach to data security. But <laughs> So there's a lot of different approaches here, but you've hit all the main topics, I believe. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That that does seem to be the attitude you hear about tape a bit. Is you know, it, it's it's data that we're going to write to write to a non rewritable format because we're going to put it on the shelf and that's the last time we'll ever touch it. Uh, but you, well, what's interesting about that is that, as you said, that 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 scenario has really changed. I think people now recognize that data does need to be reaccessed. Uh, either to, you know, meet, you know, compliance or audit requirements, and that's going to be a, a, a real chore if you're having to sort through tapes. Um, but also as we move into the next generation of AIML, as, you know, as, as corporations advance to using, you know, that historical data as decision-making tools, uh, the tape is going to be increasingly seen as a, as a really non-viable format for doing that because the data, you, you need to have it be searchable. You need to have it be instantly accessible. And, you know, whether you're talking about compliance or, you know, the future of AIML, tape just doesn't meet those requirements, whereas object storage, it's real-time access, um, really does. And, I, you know, I think it, it's just helpful just to make one, you know, little level, level setting comment here about why why is this different? I think people sometimes think it's just another storage system and therefore, you know, if you're talking about cost savings, it's just smoke and mirrors. There are some very tangible reasons why object storage saves costs, and I'll just briefly touch on these. Uh, but just in case anyone has any, you know, concerns or questions about, you know, what, what's different here, uh, this is all storage is built on industry standard servers. We sell appliances, but they're built on industry standard servers. And what that means is that it is the, you know, the cost has been driven out of every component because it's the same server you use to run all your virtual machines. It's just these happen to be ones that are storage intensive. So they've got a lot of storage inside a, a, a rack. They're not designed for performance. You know, we're, we're, this is not the this is not the storage you're going to run your database on. So as a result, you know, it keeps the processor costs down. It keeps the cooling costs down because they're, they're not designed to be the, the fastest thing. They're designed to be storage intensive. Uh, they're also designed for density. So you bring the, the, you know, the cost of space you're consuming down. This, is, you know, this example I've shown here is one and a half petabytes in a 4U rack height. So you, know, you think about what that could do in terms of saving space inside your data center when you can pack, you know, one and a half petabytes in just four U of, of rack height. Uh, the storage overhead is very low because the data is not replicated. A lot of traditional storage systems protect data by replicating it. You know, in the, in the old days, they used to call them business continuance volumes, which is a simple, you know, kind of a, a fancy way of saying wasteful replication. Uh, that's not done anymore. We now use erasure coding to essentially stripe data across so it protects data on a grand scale you know, across systems the same way you'd protect it across drives in a RAID array, <clears throat> except now we're doing it across multiple systems. So you can have an entire system failure or even an entire site failure and still be able to data because it's been striped across multiple devices. But it eliminates any re uh, replication that's uh, incredibly wasteful. And then last thing is, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on this a little more in the next slide. But, you know, no more data migrations. You know, this is an evergreen environment, uh, which is exabyte scalable in a, in a single system and eliminates a need for data migration. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow a single administrator to manage a lot more data. Yeah, it, it's just incredible how much you can do when the system, when the underlying system itself is very scalable. You know, it's driving a large, you know, it's flying people around in a 747 as opposed to flying around in a 737. You can just carry a lot more people with a single pilot 
And that's really the analogy that's going on here is we're creating a large storage infrastructure. And, and Randy, I think, you know, you and I, you, you kind of hit on this point, which is why that infrastructure is so important because, you know, the cost of managing that infrastructure is, is significant in the traditional storage systems. You know, as you, as you bring a system in, there's data migrations, getting the data in there. Then there is, you know, disruptive software updates, disruptive hardware updates, in addition to the migration itself, that doesn't happen in this storage environment. You know, you, yes, the storage, the system is a collection of nodes, but as those older nodes, you know, age out, they get to, you know, four years old or five years old, whatever your particular you know, requirement is for you know, uh, uh, refreshing hardware, as those older nodes age out, they simply are decommissioned and replaced with newer nodes. So the whole system gets kind of refreshed on a rotating basis, in addition to which, you know, the software also gets updated on a rotating basis. So you never have the system down because every piece of it is updated uh, individually and the entire system stays up and running, whether you're talking about software updates, hardware refreshes, uh, and you simply never have to migrate data from that to another environment ever again. So you actually increased your system utilization if you look at the whole, you know, the whole lifespan by at least 20% because you've eliminated that whole period at the front and the back when you're migrating data off of it and then back onto another, onto another system. Yeah, Randy, do you, see, do you see your customers kind of factoring in you know, the cost of management and the overall storage environment? You know, there's uh, two ways to look at this. One is um, every time there's a storage system to be replaced, they end up saying, let's say I'm going to, like you were talking about, uh, if it's a five-year cycle, they end up carving up maybe six months at the beginning and six months at the end as overlap, allowing for migration time. So their actual usage, if you you can do economics on that and say you are not getting what you paid for for that two different six month periods because you're having to spend time migrating and certainly for the most part they don't do a very good job of budgeting the administration time for doing the migration it does take administrative time no matter what a vendor might tell you that's why having a system where it's automated so I don't have to migrate data I can add more nodes to it and the data gets redistributed, I can retire a node and it, it'll remanage the data, you know, refactor the data somewhere else. Those are perfect. And all of a sudden now I've changed the philosophy from moving, you know, changing a device and moving the data to only worrying about the data. And it's the fact that it's on this device now or gets moved to this device, all automated, no longer do I have to worry about it. So taking out that data migration is really a big deal. Yeah, it, it, it's something that it, it takes time for the administrators. It also you know, drives up the effective cost of the storage system itself because that utilization is obviously impacted by that what's in effect downtime for the system. So yeah, I, I think it's a significant chunk and. Yeah, it's it's interesting, Randy, because if you look at you know if you look at the hyperscale cloud providers when they were getting started, you know, some years ago it wasn't that long ago, though it seems like long ago now. You know, they looked at the they looked at this exact scenario we're talking about here, and they said, yeah, how are we going to make ensure profitability? How are we going to ensure flexibility? Yeah, how are we going to manage our environment? And they came to the conclusion pretty quickly that traditional storage wasn't going to function for the bulk of their data. So they, they really pioneered in getting object storage to the next level uh, as a service in their case, uh, but we're taking that exact same technology and applying it to enterprise data center, but for the exact same reasons, it fixes this problem. They, you know, clearly you could not run a hyperscale data center if you had to do massive storage migrations. It just wouldn't work. So they face this exact same problem. We're solving that problem for the enterprise customer. And just to, you know, just to, uh, you know, again, why why is this different? Well, another reason why it's different is, you know, your underlying hardware is your choice. 
and this is this is important because some of our customers have standardized on a particular hardware solution and for them that is the lowest cost way to go because they have standardized on it they're getting a great deal from that vendor you know they can keep their maintenance costs down because everything looks the same you know the exact same reason why you know uh, Southwest Airlines flies all 737s because that standardization really helps them well you can do that with object storage because you can deploy software on those servers and take advantage of all that standardization you, you've achieved. So if that's, if that's your game, you've got that option. Then that, for, for the customer that really just wants to have you know, the, the single throat to choke option, we offer appliances as well. So whatever your financial model is, you know, whether it's you prefer to have that single supplier function or you prefer to have you know a standardized hardware platform either way you know you've got an option to meet that meet that requirement so with, with that randy why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, close out with your concluding thoughts here <laughs> Yeah, where we started this discussion was the fact that uh, there's an immediate demand to reduce expenses, and and that's because of the environment we're in, and this is going to be there for the next year. So it really is a challenge. How do you reduce expenses, get your uh, financial environment in a better position so you don't have to take drastic measures like reducing staff, for example, or cutting services. So looking at this, there's several approaches. We talked about it, and these are things that are can be done that have immediate savings and can change the dynamics, the dynamics about what it's going to cost you to protect data, what it's going to cost for that next acquisition of storage, can I reduce it? Figure out what those use cases are of how I can save some money here. Obviously, if I'm going to move data around or put it onto systems that are less costly, I have to figure out what those are. And fairly simple to do, you, you can determine what that candidate data is, we call it, and then move that data to the object storage system. Uh, John gave you an example of one vendor they work with that moves data around. Obviously, if I'm using backup software or whatever, they can target it directly. I can access it directly. A lot of different ways to do that. You're going to free up that capacity, change some of the operational practices uh, that are much simpler in the data protection area and, and really save a lot of money over the short term and do this without building a big project that requires extra resources. So fairly straightforward. I encourage everybody to do this. It's a much better way to reduce expenses than to have staff cuts, anything else that may be a way that executives are looking at things. Yeah, but the, the cost we're looking at here, you know, if you look at on-prem cloud store, you know, private cloud storage, uh, you're looking at a half a cent per gigabyte per month. Uh, and that's including you know, the, the cost of housing it in a, in a colo, uh, you know, renting that rack space, renting the connectivity to it. Uh, so that it really drives down the, the overall cost of the environment. And, it, and again, the point here is that you've got multiple use cases for it. We call it a private cloud because, uh, you know, the whole point of a cloud is to be shared. You know, it can be shared across multiple companies. It can also be shared across multiple users within a single company. And we've got major customers now that are standardizing on object storage as a private cloud, but using it in exactly the same way that they would use a public cloud. It's just it's under their control, behind their firewall, at substantially less cost. And obviously, that's the bottom line of all of this is, yes, you can, you can build a better mousetrap, you can provide better security, you can provide faster access, but you know, the, the bottom line is always going to be, is it going to save me money? And the answer in every case with this solution is absolutely. It's going to save you money versus other ways uh, of, of going about it. So with that, uh, I think we've got some questions. And uh, Laura, you want to take a look at what we've got in our in our stack here? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you, Randy. This has been great information. We have uh, had it spark quite a number of questions here. So let's get answering. Um, first question is uh, why is S3 compatibility significant? Yeah, oh, so I mentioned, I mentioned the S3 backend uh, on that. And, you know, it, yeah, that is kind of the common denominator is all the applications that talk to, you know, Cloudian or talk to, you know, 
cloud storage are now using the S3 API. Uh, it's significant for two reasons. One is it's a standard. Obviously, that's a big deal because if you've got a standard, that means everyone's developing software for it. It also means you're, you've got choices, right? You can take the data to on-prem storage, you can take it to the cloud, and you can use that same API for, for doing that. The reason why S3 API is important overall in the big, bigger picture is that it's the API, it's the storage language that was written for storage at a distance. It's written for storage at scale. So it was created for the hyperscale community because it manages storage that's located somewhere else, either in a colo or in a, you know, in a cloud somewhere else. But it manages it in a way where you can manage large amounts of data easily. Uh, you know, so it's built for scale, it's built for distance. Uh, you know, simple things like, you know, multi-part upload, the ability to do large data transfers and, and, and uh, recover cleanly if something gets interrupted in the middle of a transfer. You don't have to start the whole thing over again. Innovations like that really make the S3 API a, a game changer in storage, and it's part of the reason why object storage is so revolutionary is that it uses that API. Okay, great. Well, kind of as a follow-on to that, there's a uh, another question here. I don't know if it's the same uh, person asking, but they ask, is the API the only way to manage? Is there a dashboard or some other interface? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a little bit different question, uh, and that's a great one because, uh, yeah, Yes, the API is, is uh, directly manageable via CLI, if that's, if that's what you prefer. Uh, we also offer management dashboards, such as the one you're seeing on your screen right now. This is our, our newly announced product called HyperIQ, uh, which gives you a visual view of your environment. Uh, so, yes, you can manage uh, either way. You can, using the CLI, you're talking to the API directly, or you can use uh, the management dashboards we offer. Okay. Um, who usually buys this device? Is it a company that is looking for a different me method than a regular NAS? Yeah, you know, the, 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 who, who usually buys it? it, it this is a very uh, horizontal solution. It's, it's applicable in a wide number of use cases and consequently is a, uh, to a different wide variety of companies as well. And that could range anywhere for, from a, you know, a, a, a smaller company that's very data intensive, perhaps they're in a business like genomics uh, that is collecting a large amount of information with a relatively you know, small number of employees, or it could be a large company where you are um, you know, sharing a storage system across uh, users that may be distributed aground, across the globe. One of our customers is a major automaker and they've got Cloudian in, in, I believe, a dozen different locations, essentially using it the same way they would use a hyperscale cloud. So that's a wide range of, of deployments. Our deployments start as small as 100, 100 terabytes and range up to you know, many, many, many petabytes. Uh, so I guess the answer to that question is uh, pretty much everybody that's got you know, at least 100 terabytes of data. Okay, great. Uh, I find that all storage makers say that they're scalable, quote unquote. How is this different? Yeah, it, it gets it gets back to the underlying environment. So why is this different? Why is this scale? And it comes back to you know the underlying technology, which is object storage, which is designed specifically to the, solve the problem of of scale. You know, uh, you know, both SAN and NAS have limitations on their driven by the architecture, you know, how you address data and how the system can grow, you know, where the bottlenecks appear as, as the system grows. Uh, object storage was specifically designed to eliminate all of those by eliminating the, you know, the limits on the address space. That, that's no longer a part of the environment with object storage. You also don't have the limitation on the architecture because this is a shared nothing cluster. Every, every node in the environment can act, can respond to requests, and every node can provide an answer to your question, so they can all act in parallel. In fact, they can even act in parallel to fulfill a single request of, in streaming environments. So this parallelism combined with the you know, removal of any limitations on the address space 
those are the things that make it uh, truly scalable. Great. Next question is, can you provide any examples of customers who have adopted any of the aforementioned use cases of migrating to a Cloudian solution? Yeah, so we, we've got uh, numerous uh, examples on our website. So if you go to cloudian.com and you, and you search on customers, uh, go under company, look at customers, there's uh, a, many different use cases there. But these range from, uh, you know, higher education, to media and entertainment companies, to bio, uh, to uh, government. Uh, one, of our, one, of our, one example would be um, uh, a, a, a service provider for the government called MillCloud uh, provides a public cloud for uh, defense contractors. You can go to millcloud.com and you can see, uh, you know, see what this is. They they adopted Cloudian in replacing other types of storage solutions, essentially creating a cloud for you know for their customers. But a great example of how they achieved savings and scale in an environment that's very very demanding. You know, obviously very demanding in terms of security, very demanding in terms of uh, performance, uh, and you know achieved great results uh, by implementing a Cloudian environment. Great. Uh, next question is: Can Cloudian work with pure storage? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we work with anyone that has an, an S3 API connector. Uh, pure has a uh, utility called Pure Smart Store. Uh, excuse me, CloudSnap. CloudSnap, and CloudSnap is an S3 connector for uh, creating snapshots from a Pure All Flash array, and that will take snapshots and move them to a hyperscale cloud. You can just as easily take them and move them to a, a Cloudian device on-prem. And we have a solution brief on our website talking about uh, talking about exactly that. So yes, any 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 device uh, or backup software or in the media and entertainment world, you know, there's the uh, uh, media asset manager software. Anything that uses S3 talks to Cloudian directly, and then we also offer a file connector, uh, SIFS and NFS file connector for software that uh, uses uh, the, the traditional file types. So even even in that environment, we have uh, an easy way of connecting up and, and providing a, a target. Okay. So a question about uh, metadata. I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Any limits to object storage metadata? Uh, no, that well, metadata is is created on a per object basis, and we have a way of scaling metadata. So there's a there is a a, a limit per tag, but we allow a, a large number of tags per uh, per object. So in effect, uh, no, you can you can scale metadata to to large to large amounts. Um, the only limitation on our part is the metadata is stored in a in a flash device on our on our device, and the reason to, the reason for that is the metadata is searchable, so that's stored in flash. Uh, the uh, user data is stored on spinning disk, so your ultimate limit is going to be the availability of flash device within that uh, uh, flash amount within that device. Okay. Uh, another question is, what happens when my Cloudian object store gets close to full? Uh, time to buy more. Time to buy more Cloudian. So yeah, <laughs> we, 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 we continually mat, we continually monitor uh, the, uh, the amount of util, uh, utilization of your storage. We we recommend you know moving towards an upgrade when you're 80 percent. Uh, as you move to higher amounts, it, it will it will basically stop you from doing any additional writes because you get to, you get beyond a certain amount that it's not going to uh, function correctly. So, when you get to get to eighty percent, it's time to start looking at uh, scaling up your environment. Yeah, most storage systems start to give you warning messages, and and they have set thresholds, or you can even a lot of them you can even set your own thresholds, but. Um, it's pretty obvious that as you're filling up, you need to throw another log on the fire, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's it's that's been true of storage forever. Uh, you know, you always have to have a, a little bit of space left over for the management, uh, and we uh, we encourage our customers to upgrade it at uh, eighty percent. 
Great. Um, so here's one from a higher ed institution. What would be the impact of COVID-19, the new norm, on decision of data servers on public, private, cloud, or on-premise? Uh, I can take that one if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, by all means. There, there's, um, uh, we've actually had a number of customers who their um, executives said, oh, this has got to be the cheapest way. And um, they made maybe made some arbitrary judgments that just weren't true. So we always say, let's do the math. I think John mentioned that earlier. And the, they really need to, uh, the IT people need to proactively do something now to be ready with an answer and to have, to be able to show, hey, we can save some money right now. And those things will come up. They'll, they'll either be pressured to save money or you'll have some arbitrary decision, we're going to move this data and save us a bunch of money. And you say, well, you're not going to save money. We've done the work. Here it is. Here's how we can save some money. So we really recommend to our clients to be very proactive in this case. John? Yeah, I think you know, this is a, a little bit tangential, but I'll, I'll mention it because it's very relevant to COVID, and that is that one thing we've seen in this in this work-from-home era, people are very sensitive to uh, the ransomware threat. Uh, you know, the, the fact that a lot of people are working outside of their firewall, uh, a lot of folks are not on VPNs, they see the, themselves as being more exposed to ransomware. So having a backup target that provides ransomware protection is huge. Right, having that immutable copy of data that you know is protected, even even against a you know, a rogue actor within your company, it's protected. So you know it's it's it truly is immutable storage, and that provides a lot of peace of mind in this environment where folks are you know by nature distributed, working outside the firewall, and, and therefore more, more exposed to the various threats. Okay, great. Um, so probably have time for one more question. Um, we have here, it's, it's a Fed and State uh, question. What kind of data protection and management does your storage solution offer, and do you have examples of collaboration with public service implementing and maintaining the solution on their sites? And I know you mentioned MillCloud, so um, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit. Yeah, more. no, I, I can mention MillCloud because we're on, we're on their website, so that's, that's public. But we've got numerous examples in, in, in government that uh, you know, where we're deployed. Most of them are we don't have the ability to mention them because we're not on their website. But, um, yeah, absolutely. We, we work with uh, different kinds of public service institutions all the time, whether it be education, uh, federal government, state and local government. I think another one we have talked about is the state of California, through a service provider called ENS uh, is a is a cloud end user. Uh, there are numerous other states that are also cloud end users. State of Utah, for example, uh, state of Florida. So, by all means, you know these these uh, yeah you know, the examples are far and wide. Okay, great. Well, we're uh, basically at the top of the hour here. I wanted to thank you again, Randy and John, uh, for your time today um, and to the audience for joining us as well.